and welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. We'll spend most of this show talking about breast cancer. 15% of all new cancers are breast cancer. Who's at risk? What are the risk factors for getting breast cancer? What can we do to prevent breast cancer? There are some things that we can do. And early detection. What can be done to detect breast cancer early? If we detect it early, we've got excellent results of survival. My guest is Dr. Paige Johnson. Dr. Johnson is a board certified OBGYN doctor. She'll be answering our questions on breast cancer and what we can do. Hello, I'm Dr. Robert Overholt. I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes on the Dr. Bob Show. Later on, we'll be talking about if you don't get enough sleep, sleep deprivation, how does that interfere with your health? And it really, really does. And lumps and bumps in the neck, on the back, on the hands, what do they do to you? How can you tell if they're benign or malignant? A lot of information for you. You'll want to stay tuned. We're talking with Dr. Paige Johnson, board certified OBGYN physician, and we're going to be talking about breast cancer. Paige, welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. Thank you so much, Dr. Bob, for having me here. You know I love to come on your show and talk about anything in women's health. And, and you're a great, great teacher. So let's get with breast cancer. Are there different kinds of breast cancer? Well, yes, there are, because there's a little bit different types of tissue in the breast. So the two most common that we talk about arise from the ducts, which are the little tubes that take the breast milk through to the nipple, and then the lobular tissue, which is actually what makes the breast milk when women are lactating. So those are the two different types, one ductal area that's and lobular, yes. Either one of those more common than the other? Well, you know, I actually tend to see a little bit more ductal cancers, uh -huh. but um, I do believe that statistically they actually come about about the same. At what age does a woman begin to worry or need to worry or think about breast cancer? Well, I'm an OBGYN, so I take care of women from all ages. And I can honestly tell you that I don't know that there's any age group that they don't start to think about it a little good. bit. And that's good. So, and I like that because it allows me the opportunity to talk to women about things that they should be noticing about their bodies. Having said that, when I start to see the increase, or I actually have started to see diagnosis start to pick up, is after age 40. But we know statistically that it's much more common in women over the age of 50. So age 40, age 50, but age 20 to 40, there's lots of possibilities of problems going on in the breast. So let's talk about the breast, breast tissue, lumps in the breast, uh, different types of breasts, and what what women experience? Well, so women have all different kinds of breast tissue and it's difficult for women because their breast tissue from one person to the next might be completely different. And breast tissue is meant to be lumpy bumpy. You know us doctors, we always describe things based on food, right? So I always say it's kind of like raisins and pudding. I don't, it's going to have some soft areas, it's going to have some little lumpy bumpies, but what's normal is if things are soft and move and they might be a little more dense in one area, but they should never be very hard or super round or I always say like a frozen pea or a rock or I sometimes describe it as those little rubber balls you get out of the gumball machine that yeah. are real firm that type of density is a little bit too much and I encourage my patients to bring that to me but women have variations in their breast tissue and if they're doing some exams on themselves when they're in the shower they're gonna know what their breast tissue feels like and from month to month they'll kind of get used to the normal normal ebbs and flows of their breast tissue around the time of their menstrual cycle. Their breast might be a little bigger, a little more tender, a little bit more lumpy. And after the menstrual cycle, things tend to calm down and they tend to be a little softer and a little bit looser. So is the best time to examine a breast 
after somebody said the menstrual period? I usually encourage that at that yeah. time, but I am kind of of the mindset that if a woman knows her breast tissue at all times of her cycle, that's not a bad thing. So if a woman were to happen to feel some tenderness in her breast the week before her menstrual cycle and feels a lump or a bump, I encourage her to wait till after her menstrual cycle is over, see if that tenderness and that lumpy bumpiness went away. And if it did, that's probably a normal change for her. So what does a breast cancer feel like? Well, I've been doing this 20 years and believe it or not, because of mammography and screening, I haven't felt a ton of breast cancers, but I will tell you when I have felt them, there is nothing like it. Oh. They do feel very dense, very hard. And in some circumstances, they're not mobile. They don't move. They feel kind of stuck. But there are some symptoms women definitely need to look for to allow them to know whether or not they need to be evaluated. There may be some other cause for those changes, but because they're associated with breast cancer, we definitely need them to come in and be evaluated if they have those symptoms. So what are those symptoms or things that they should look for that makes them suspicious? Well, so obviously if they have a new lump and they're not sure, I would encourage them to bring that to me. Um, you can just get some generalized swelling in the breast that sometimes is a symptom. Women can have inversion or their nipple will turn sort of inward. Why does that happen? Well, because there are little ligaments that hold the breast in place. And as the cancer grows into those ligaments and invades them, it will pull those Pulls ligaments in. in and that will pull the nipple inward. So any change in the nipple, I always encourage women to have them bring it in because sometimes it won't pull it inward, but it'll pull it off to the side. So if you're normally looking at yourself and you know what your, how your nipples always say, do they point forward? Do they point out to the side? If something changes with that, we definitely want to know. Bleeding from a nipple? Well, for sure, nipple discharge can be normal in a lactating woman or a woman who's had some, uh, who's breastfed her babies. But if you have never had nipple discharge and all of a sudden you start having it, that's a reason to still see a doctor. It's not always associated with a cancer, but certainly if it's bloody or dark brown in color, we want to know about that for sure. So if somebody feels or thinks there's something wrong with their breast, and they come to the doctor. Uh, what does the doctor do? There's exam, and then what else can you do to help identify what's inside the breast tissue? Well, first thing I'm gonna do, as you know, and as we teach our students, to always do a good history and then to do a thorough physical exam. And what's involved with taking a good history is finding out what's going on with this patient, where she is in her life, what's going on with her menstrual cycles, has she started any new medications? Does she have any other symptoms that might explain this finding? So I think that's absolutely critical. Then, you know, family history is pretty important because if she's got a first degree relative that had a history of breast cancer, well, first off, she's gonna be pretty worried about that and that's gonna up my game as far as making sure that I make her satisfied. But the other thing that's pretty important too about her family history is just to make sure that she's aware that there are risk factors associated with her family's health that we may be able to uncover and help with. When we're talking about risk factors, so we'll be talking about who is at risk to develop it. We've said number one, family history. N number two, age. Right. Uh, in, in, anything and number else? three, really the biggest risk factor is going to be that you're a female. Because as you and I both know and tell our patients on a regular basis that one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer. One in eight women. I know. Uh, uh, that's pretty high. That's pretty high. It incidence. really is. And unfortunately, that means we're all going to have somebody in our lives that we're going to be touched by this disease. And so because of that, we want to make sure that we're counseling our patients appropriately and that they are empowered to come see us if they have questions or concerns. Tender breast. Tender breast, that's a tough one, right? Because we know that pain in the breast could be associated with breast cancer, but most of the time it's not. So again, it's about getting the history and finding out, well, are your breasts tender every month before your menstrual cycle? Is this something completely new? I oftentimes have women come and maybe have a little breast tenderness because they've been doing a new workout and they're a little bit sore. And because it's in the breast area, they're very concerned. So taking a good history and then doing an exam and feeling the breast tissue. And just in my experience, I can sometimes really reassure somebody that everything's okay. It must be great for somebody to have a painful, uh, tender 
lump, lumpy breast and have the doctor say it's okay. Are there diagnostic tools that we can use to help the doctor decide what's going on in the breast? Absolutely. And, and that's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about what type of x-rays or ultrasounds or MRIs or what is available that we can use to help detect a lump that's sort of suspicious. We're talking with Dr. Paige Johnson, board certified OBGYN. We've been talking about breast cancers. We've been talking about the ducts that bring the milk to the breast. We've talked about the lobular, the lobules that produce the milk. We've talked about pain. We've talked about bleeding of the nipple, inverted nipples, changes in the breast, the feeling of a lump, uh, making sure that you talk with your doctor if you have a lump in the breast. And then we started talking about diagnostic tools. If somebody comes in, they've got a little lump, or they've got a tender area, what do you do to help diagnostically? Well, so if I have a problem, then I'm gonna write an order and I'm gonna schedule that patient for a diagnostic mammogram typically. Now, if the patient is young, say they're under the age of 35, sometimes the breast tissue is so dense that the mammogram, which is an X-ray of the breast, won't penetrate the breast tissue and the breast tissue will look suspicious even though it's normal just because it's so dense. So in that circumstance, in women very young, we will typically do an ultrasound first to establish whether or not we can see any kind of mass in that area. What's an ultrasound like? An ultrasound of the breast, what do they do? Well, actually what they do is they take a little wand Mm -hmm. and they put a little gel on it mm -hmm. and they actually roll it over the breast tissue. It's painless for most of my patients um, and it takes very short period of time and it gives the radiologist a lot of information. So it sends a sound wave that comes back and you can look at that on an image. What, what is a cancer, what's he looking for? Well, cancers actually have a special appearance in the breast tissue, and they're very um, different in appearance than say something like a cyst, mm -hmm. which is gonna look really black on the inside, or say a benign tumor like a fibroadenoma, or breast changes called fibrocystic changes. They all look very different. Cancers typically are gonna be brighter and they're gonna be more dense in appearance. They can have some calcifications that are characteristic. And so the radiologist can use that pretty well in somebody with denser breast tissue. So there's a big differential diagnosis of things that can be causing something that's abnormal. That's the ultrasound. If the ultrasound says there's an area we're worried about, do you have any other imaging that you can do of a breast? Well, so if we've got a patient who's 40 years old or older, I'm definitely gonna start with a mammogram, but when you write for a diagnostic mammogram, that gives the radiologist the opportunity to do the mammogram first and if they still need some clarification they may add an ultrasound to that. Now if you've got somebody that is high risk for a breast cancer, for example somebody who's had a breast cancer before or somebody who has a first degree relative that had a breast cancer at a younger age or heaven forbid somebody that actually has a breast cancer gene which increases their risk of developing breast cancer, those women then may undergo an MRI. Now, the benefit to the MRI is, is that it sees a whole lot. It's very, very detailed information. But unfortunately, you don't wanna do that in people that are lower risk because sometimes you see things and you're like, well, that looks suspicious when really it's not. So it gives a lot more information, but at the same time, it's expensive and it's not really required of everybody, but it's definitely beneficial to those women who are higher risk. So if somebody comes in, they have a suspicious area, they get an ultrasound, they get a diagnostic mammogram. Uh, can you get a pretty, with what percentage, accurateness do you get when you say, looks like everything's okay right now, we want to look at it again in six months? Very good chances. As a matter of fact, most of my patients reports will come back and they will be able to say, hey, this looks fine and we'll see you back next year. 
Having said that, if there is some suspicion or the patient has a high risk factor, they may get to follow up in six months. I rarely see less than six months. And typically, again, those are in individuals who have pretty high risk factors. Yeah, everybody's different. Yes. Every breast is different. Every history is different. So let's talk, when we're talking about risk, let's look at some of the risk factors. You mentioned some genes, genetic. What do you mean by that as a risk factor? Well, so in particular, the two most common that we see are what we call BRCA, breast cancer gene one and two. And so those carry with them not only just an increased risk of breast cancer of greater than 50% of those individuals, so it's very high, wow. but it also increases the risk of other cancers, in particular in my specialty, ovarian cancer and even colon cancer. Now there are some other gene abnormalities and believe it or not, we're discovering new ones all the time that have a lower incidence, but still us increased over the average person in the population that they may develop a breast cancer. So if I was worried about my breasts and I had lumpy breasts and the doctor wasn't sure about one little spot, should I get genetic counseling? Do you, when should you get genetic counseling? I know it's a big question. It is a big question and believe it or not, we have, as time's gone on, we've gotten much more comfortable with who should and who shouldn't. As a matter of fact, just recently, all women who are diagnosed with breast cancer have been recommended to get the breast cancer one and two gene testing. Having said that, if you have a first degree relative, and what I mean by that is a mother or a brother or a sister, then you should get tested for the breast cancer gene if they are positive. And if you get a positive BRCA1, BRCA2, the, uh, the, the genes, they're normally there for protection, but they mutate and don't protect. So what do you tell somebody? Their chances are increased? Do you, what do you do? Well, so in that circumstance, then as an OBGYN, I am going to refer them to a breast specialist. Um, and I have people in the community that I love that do an amazing job. And again, because every woman is individual and she yeah. has to know her risks of breast cancer, it depends on her age, whether or not she's done having her babies or not. And so that's really something that's very important and it has to be individualized to the woman. But there are treatments available to help prevent her from ever developing breast cancer. Uh, like what treatments? Well, so there are, if, she is a breast cancer, we'll definitely screen her in the higher risk category. Uh -huh. So you and I have talked before that there's a little controversy about when women should start mammography and how often they should have it. But women in that category are definitely higher risk and fall into a different category where they're screened more frequently. And typically every six months, they'll get a mammogram alternating with an MRI. So that's one thing, is you increase the surveillance to detect those cancers as soon as possible if they're going to occur. So let's go through it again. What age do we recommend that women get their mammography? Well, so my college, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the American Radiology Association both still recommend at the age of 40 that women be screened with a screening mammogram every year. So every year. Every year. And that's where the question is. Some people say it's further. And, and I've commented before on television. I said, you know, my wife, I want her to have a mammography every single year because age is one of the risk factors. Right. What are some of the other things that we can do? We've got a short period of time to maybe prevent getting breast cancer? Well, as an OBGYN, that's my favorite thing to talk about because I'm all about prevention because there are things we can all do. And you know, there are some things you can't help, right? You cannot help your genetics and women can't help what age they start their menstrual cycles or what age they're gonna go through menopause. And those are the things that increase your risk beyond your control. But you can exercise. We know that women that are overweight or obese have an increased risk of breast cancer. We also know that women who drink alcohol, more than one alcoholic beverage a day, have an increased risk. And so limiting your alcohol consumption certainly can decrease your risk. So that's lifestyle changes. Yes. Uh, obesity, would that be one? Absolutely. So we watch our weight, we watch our alcohol, we watch our lifestyle, and that gives us a better chance of not developing breast cancer. And then we've got diagnostic tools. I think the, the important thing that I see in breast cancer is if we can find it early, if it's going to be there, if one in eight women are going to get breast cancer, 
if we find it really early, what are the success rates? Oh, it's very treatable. And that's what that's the reason why my college still recommends mammography yearly. Because it's we want to diagnose as early as possible. We want to treat women as early as possible so that we don't disrupt their lives and we keep them here to take care of their families and their children and to be in their communities. Um, and to come back and see the gynecologist on a yearly basis. Paige, you're a wonderful, wonderful teacher. I want to thank you so much for coming thank to you. the Dr. Bob Show, talking about breast cancer and such an important illness, and we're learning more and more all the time to keep breast health better. Thank you. Thank you. A lot of great information. Be sure that um, you know that men can get breast cancer, very rare, uh, but women should be able to talk with their doctor understand their breast tissue. If they feel a lump, bring it to the tension and know that at age 40, you need to be sure that you start your mammography. And now you're gonna want, you're gonna want to stay tuned. A lot of information left. We're gonna be talking about the hazards of not getting enough sleep. If you're sleep deprived, the body doesn't do very well. And lumps and bumps, uh, are they dangerous or not? <laughs> I want to thank Dr. Paige Johnson. Wonderful discussion on breast cancer, risk factors, and diagnosis. And now a question from you, the viewer, that I think will be important to your health. Dr. Bob, question number one. I don't sleep well. Does that affect my health? Well, it really, really does. The body is made where it needs sleep. We average needing seven and a half hours sleep every night. We need to go to bed at the same time. We need to get up at the same time. We need to sleep well. If we're not sleeping well, we need to think of reasons why. Is it the room? Is it noise? Is it pain? Is there our medications? All of those things can interfere with a good night's sleep. Do we prepare before we go to bed? Do we quiet down? Do we slow down? Do we begin to relax? All of those things are important. When we do not get enough sleep, when we're chronically sleep deprived, it does three or four things. Number one, it increases blood pressure. So the body tries to protect itself. The adrenal hormones come out to try and stimulate us and it stimulates the blood pressure. The blood pressure goes up. The immune system doesn't work as well when we don't sleep well. And so there's a greater chance of getting infection and we don't get over infections as well if we're not getting adequate sleep. There's an increased incidence of obesity just because we're not sleeping well. There's increased what we call insulin resistance. Insulin doesn't work well. People stay hungry, they eat more, they get overweight. Uh, the body doesn't fight off infection well. The body simply doesn't perform well. All, not only are you irritable, crabby, have a fog in front of you all the time uh, when you don't sleep, so know that getting adequate sleep is so important. Dr. Johnson was just saying, I think every doctor should specialize in sleep because sleep deprivation, deprivation is so important in, in our society. Not sleeping well, talk it over with your doctor. Question number two, Dr. Bob. I have a lump in my neck. Should I be worried? Well. There are lymph node chains in the neck where we get little lumps, little lymph nodes that can swell. Normally, we don't have lymph nodes in the neck as we get older. Young people, we want to feel some lymph nodes. That means their immune system is working well. If you get a swelling in the neck or under the arm or in the groin where the lymph nodes are, if that starts to enlarge, if it's tender, if it doesn't move well, if it's sort of fixed to the tissue, if it's gritty, if it's hard, those are all bad signs. Those are signs you need to have your doctor check it out. If he is suspicious, he'll get a biopsy of that. There are other places where we get lumps and bumps, cysts on the back, little fibroma, little nodules on the hands. Those usually are insignificant. Sometimes they're cosmetically unattractive, but they don't really cause problems. If you feel a lump or a bump and it enlarges and it doesn't go away and it's tender, you simply have to talk it over with your doctor. He'll be able to help you. He'll know the anatomy. He'll know the chances of that being a benign or a malignant area. So be sure that you 
think of lumps and bumps and think of talking to your doctor about that. It's all the time that we have for this show. Remember to be exercising. Maybe the most important thing you can do, exercise 30 minutes on a regular basis, not five here, 10 there, 15 there. 30 minutes regular, five, six, seven days a week and make that important part of your health. It decreases your blood pressure, helps you decrease weight, makes you feel better, makes you happier, gives you that runner's high. Eat properly, eat better, more fruits, fibers uh, in your diet. Eat less as the day goes on. We tend to eat more and more as the day goes on. You all know what good food is like, so pick out the good foods and eat more of those and eat less of the fried foods and the foods that may be bad for your health. Seven and a half hours of sleep, uh, that's what the average of most people need. If you'll get seven and a half hours sleep, go to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time, you'll feel refreshed, you'll perform better, and you'll do a lot better. And what is it that we like most of all in the Dr. Bob show? And it's that laughter in your life. When I look around and I see happy people, and I see people that are laughing, I see people that giggle a lot, giggle a lot they're healthier people. The people around them are happier. It puts a feeling of happiness and friendliness in the room. And people enjoy being in those settings. And when they enjoy those settings, the body performs well. The body will be better. You'll stay healthier when you stay happy.